OK, is everybody able to see the um, PowerPoint slides? Yeah. OK. So this is the second half of chapter three that we did the started the other day with the skulls. So at, by now you should be pretty familiar with um, the skulls, the bones that make up the skull, the cranial bones, and we talked about the facial bones. And now we're going to get into a little bit more detail on these particular bones to the um, features that you really need to know about. And the PowerPoint stuck. Nope, that's not what I meant to do, sorry. Okay, it's because I have it open in Canvas too. Let me get rid of this. Now, hopefully our PowerPoints will look the same. OK, can you see that now? Yes. OK. Right. So um, we talked about and for review the facial bones. You have the vomer. Grab my skull. I'll show you these again just to make sure we're all. Can you see the skull? Can we? I can. Okay. So the vomer was this little green bone that was inside the nose. And if you flipped up, you could also see it inside from the underside down here. And then we have the mandible, which I have taken off, but we're going to go through the mandible has a lot of features on it that you'll need to know. So we're going to go through that one um, pretty carefully. The lacrimal bones were these two little tiny bones right here in the corner. The nasal bones were these two tiny ones that make up the top of the nose. The inferior nasal concha were these little two little stacked things. The inferior one was the one that's closer to the bottom or more inferior. Then we had the superior in the middle. The superior and the middle come off of the ethmoid bone and the inferior is a facial bone of its own. The zygomatic bones are these purple ones right here. Together with the temporal bone, they make the zygomatic arch. Okay, I think somebody's trying to get back in. There we go. The maxilla is this yellow bone, which is pretty big. If you look underneath, it makes up the anterior hard palate. The maxilla also comes all the way up and meets the frontal bone, all the way up here, kind of between your eyes. And then you have the palatine bones, which are questionable about whether or not they're facial bones, but they are those two little purple ones that form the posterior hard palate or the back side of the hard palate. The hard palate is formed by four different bones. You've got the two um, that are on the maxilla and they are fused together by the median palatine suture. And then you have the two palatine bones or horizontal plates because they run horizontally of the palatine bones. They also are fused together by the median palatine suture and then the transverse palatine suture fuses the maxillary bones with the palatine bones. And it's that little suture. The two sutures form a T shape. Many of your facial bones are shaded 
are shared by two or more soft tissue structures. So in other words, um, the frontal bone forms both the forehead and the areas around the eyes. So the frontal bone, this big blue one, helps to form the area around your eyes. It also forms your forehead. Your maxilla forms a lot of things. So your vomer is, your, is a thin, flat, single bone in the midline. It's that little green one. Your nasal septum, at the posterior part, your nasal septum is this area right inside the skull. I don't know how well you can see that, but right inside the skull, there is a bone that kind of comes down the center. It's a very thin kind of plate-like bone. Can you guys see that? That little area divides the nose in half. And um, the posterior bone or the back part of that bone is the vomer. And the front part is the ethmoid bone. And you can kind of see that um, based on the two different colors. One part is white, one part is green. So the articulations, the articulations are the other bo bones that meet that particular bone. So in other words, the vomer's articulations are the other bones that meet up with the, with the vomer. And they form like the sides, like in other words, the orbit has all these different colors inside of it. These are all the bones that articulate with each other to form the, the orbit. So you've got um, the bones that articulate with this little green vomer bone are listed on this particular slide, slide number six. You will not necessarily have to memorize which bones articulate with which bones. In a question, both in my quizzes, the midterm, the final, or on boards, it may ask you a question about like it articulates with the vomer and it does this. So if you know the end that does this part, you do not have to memorize the articulations. The articulations um, I would mention in a question or they're mentioned in board questions so that you um, know it gives you some idea of location. You can kind of figure out where um, the, the bone is located. So the posterior border or the back side of the vomer has no bony articulation. So you can kind of see, well, you can't really see it, but it has no bony articulation. So it's just kind of back there. Um, that means there's an airspace there. The inferior border or the bottom is the median palatine suture. So if you follow this narrow little bone down, straight down, it would come down to the median palatine suture right here. And the anterior border or the front part, which is the part you really care about for now, is the um, perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. So the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone is this thin little white plate that comes down in the middle of the nose. It's a perpendicular because it forms a T with the base, making it perpendicular. It's a plate because it's flat, and it, of the ethmoid bone means it's on the ethmoid bone. Does that make sense? So you can kind of see, if, I don't know how well you can see in here, but you can see the little green bone meeting with the white bone. That white bone is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. Any questions on that? If you are able to, I don't know how much you can share on your screens or look at on your screens or have two different screens open, but you can also open some pictures, um, just Google some pictures and look at some of these pictures and you can get a better view of them. Um, this picture, particular picture came right out of your textbook. So if you want to look at the pictures in your textbook too, they're very good pictures to look at um, at the same time while I'm going through this. Or you can, I mean, obviously I've got this one on there, but there are other pictures in the book that show different views that might be helpful.
Here's a colored picture of where the vomer is located um, from the from the anterior view or looking straight at the skull. You can see um, the little vomer part is marked on that skull as well as this one. And then if you look at it from a lateral view or the side view, you can see that the vomer, the part that you see from the front, is just very small. The vomer goes back. It's still a small bone compared to the others, but it goes back pretty deep. You have your lacrimal bones. They form a small part of the anterior medial wall of the orbit. So when you're looking at this, if you were to see this anterior medial wall of the orbit, you're going to get in a, on a quiz. You're going to get a little bit overwhelmed. Break down your words. What does anterior mean? Somebody answer. Front. OK, and medial. Middle, middle. Closer to the middle. So mm -hmm. you're going to be at the front and closer to the middle wall of the orbit. So it's going to be right here in the front and closer to the middle because this would be the lateral side of the orbit. Mm -hmm. This is the medial side. This one's closer to the middle. This is closer to the outside. So it's that small and it's the smallest and most fragile of the facial bones. So it's a very delicate bone. Your lacrimal bone, if you bones, if you look at them in the red, you can see that they articulate or they join together with the ethmoid, the frontal, and the maxilla. Make sure I'm pointing to the maxilla. So if you look inside, I don't know how well you can see that from here. But if you look inside, you can see the white ethmoid bone joins with that red bone. You can see the blue frontal bone that joins with it and the yellow maxilla that joins with it. That's what they mean by articulations. They help form or they connect to that to form some sort of an object. Your lacrimal bones contain your nasolacrimal duct. So if you were to break that word down, naso being nose and lacrimal being in the lacrimal area, eye area um, formed at the junction of the lacrimal bone and the maxilla. So right where this yellow bone is, okay, and the um, lacrimal bone, the red bone right here, that's where your nasolacrimal duct is. Your nasolacrimal duct is responsible for tears coming through that gland. So the tears will work their way down. And if you look at that picture, you can see that the nasolacrimal duct runs all the way down to the nose. That probably has something to do with why your nose runs when you cry. And then the next slide on slide 11, um, number eight, I circled them with black. Those are your lacrimal bones. And so that's actually supposed to be a picture of this skull, but the red came out a little bit more orange on those. But um, the number eight are those little bones on the inside. Stop me if you have any questions, okay? The nasal bones from the bridge of the nose in the midline superior to the piriform aperture. What's the piriform aperture? Somebody guess. It's okay to guess wrong. Somebody guess what's the piriform aperture? Does anybody remember? OK, everybody, if you have your book handy, look it up. And tell me what it is. Is it like the opening at the nasal? Like Ex where exactly. the nose opens? It is. It's exactly it. It's kind of almost like a triangular shaped opening. Just kind of outlines these bones right here. That's your piriform aperture. And so the midline superior to it, 
are the nasal bones. And I've circled the nasal bones. They're in purple on the skull. And they are between the frontal processes of the maxilla. So the frontal processes of the maxilla. So we're going to start with of the maxilla means they're on the maxilla. So we can start with knowing on the maxilla is the yellow part, right? The whole yellow is the maxilla. So the frontal processes are going to be the part of the maxilla that meets the frontal bone. So the part of the maxilla that meets the frontal bone. So if you look at the skull closely, hopefully you can see, or the one on the PowerPoint, you can see that the two, the maxilla comes up the sides and meets the frontal, the blue frontal bone, and right in the middle is sitting those two purple nasal bones. So they sit right between the frontal processes of the maxilla. And that suture is called the nasal, frontonasal suture. So right where those two bones connect is called the frontonasal suture. It's hard to see, but right there. In other words, frontal and nasal bones connect at the suture. That's one of those sutures that's on the list that I told you you didn't have to memorize. But as you can see, even if you didn't memorize it, if you just break it down, you would easily be able to tell where it's located. Frontal, so the frontal bone, and nasal, where the nasal bone and frontal bone meet. And that's the frontonasal suture. And so when you break your nose, is that the note? Is that the bones that you break when you break your nose? Yeah, you could probably break the maxilla too if it was bad enough. But yes, when you break your nose, that's what you break because the whole rest of that part of your nose that sticks out is the is just cartilage. That's why it's not on a skull because it's not a bone. So when you break it, that's where you're going to be breaking. Um, if you've ever broken your nose or know anybody that has their eyes turn black and blue. Um, because it's way up here. So it makes it runs the blood across and forms black and blue or bruises around the eyes usually when you break your nose. And these are pictures of the nasal bones. And they're number seven and they're the purple ones right on the top. On the frontal view and then you can see them on the lateral view. So now we've got your inferior nasal concha. There's not a whole lot to know about your inferior nasal concha. They are paired facial bones because there's two of them, one in each side of the nose, that project from the maxilla and form a part of the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. So if you see all those words, the lateral wall is the outer wall or away from the midline of the nasal cavity. So when you're taking a quiz, in my class or when you're taking a test when you're taking boards and you see questions worded like this there's going to be a lot of words because we're trying to describe where something's located um, we don't have addresses like you do when you're trying to find a house or a building or something like that on our bones so we just describe where they're located if you can get good and practice dissecting the question so that you know starting out what are we looking at because you're not going to be able to answer the question unless you know for sure what you're looking for and so breaking it down and trying to get a feel for where you're at on something is a good starting point unlike the superior and middle nasal concha from the ethmoid bone that project inward off the lateral walls of the nasal cavity the inferior nasal concha are separate facial bones so just remember that they are separate facial bones. And on slide 15 are pictures of the inferior nasal concha. If we could see them really clearly um, on the skull, they kind of painted them in purple. You can sort of see, let me see if I can get in there, in here, the little purple bone. It's a light purple. It's kind of hard to see, but that's the inferior nasal concha. I, on the skull, this particular skull, they are number 12. 
you can't really see them from the lateral view because they're blocked by the walls but of the maxilla but i just threw that view in because i was copying and pasting the same slide the zygomatic bones these purple bones right here form the majority of the cheekbone and helps to form the lateral wall of the floor of the orbit so the lateral would be farther from the midline or the outer wall of the orbit and you can kind of see if you look inside the orbit you can see right here the lateral or outer wall is purple that's your zygomatic bone it's kind of a tricky little bone it's not um, it's small but it's got a lot of tricks to it it's composed of three processes the processes jet out to join other bones so you've got the frontal process so right where the zygomatic bone meets the frontal bone right up here, this is the frontal process. Can you, am I holding the skull in the right place to see that? Can you Anybody? Want to go closer? Closer? Yeah. Like that? Yes, thank you. Okay, so the frontal process would be this part right here. It's the part of the zygomatic bone that goes up to the frontal bone, which is this blue one. And then you've got the temporal process. So here's the temporal bone, this big orange one. So this one that jets back to the temporal bone is the temporal process. And then you've got um, the, uh, where am I? Maxillary process is where it meets the maxilla. So it's this part right here that dro drops down and meets this yellow maxilla is the maxillary process. So it's kind of a complicated little bone. These two right here are your zygomatic arch, and that's your cheekbone. And you can feel um, if you slide down from your temple and go down, you can feel it goes all the way back, that bone does. So it's a pretty big arch. It's not just this little cheekbone part where we um, look at your face and think of as your face. It's also this part that goes all the way back across. And the articulations or the bones that the zygomatic bone meets with are of course the frontal, the temporal, the maxilla, maxilla and then the sphenoid bone. So if we flip the skull up, we, we, well, I guess we can see it best from here. Can you see that? So if you look from here, you can see where the purple meets the red. The red is the sphenoid bone. If we rotate the skull this way, you can see the sphenoid bone. And the red and the purple where they meet, that's the other um, articulation. So it meets with all four of those bones. And then this is um, slide 18 is a picture of those processes. So you can kind of see them better. When you're looking at a skull that's not colored, you can still see this, where the bones separate, where the suture lines are. Each one of those suture lines has a name. And basically, we're not going to learn their names, but if you wanted to know their names, you just combine the two words. And then here's a picture of this skull. And the bones are number five. They're the purple ones. The palatine process of the maxilla. So the palatine process of the maxilla, of the maxilla means it's on the maxilla. So if you flip your skull up, the palatine process of the maxilla form the anterior part of the hard palate. So your hard palate has two parts, the anterior part and the posterior part. Oftentimes it gets confusing when you're studying it and you're taking a quiz that students think the hard palette is the um, the orange part in that picture and the soft palette is the yellow part because it's back further. It's the that's all the hard palette and it makes up it's made of the palatine process of the maxilla. So it's on the maxilla or of the maxilla means on the maxilla, which is why it's yellow. It's part of the maxilla. And then the posterior part are the horizontal plates, meaning plates being they're flat, because that's what plates are, like dinner plates. 
So they're flat bones and they run horizontally of the palatine bone. So those are the horizontal plates of the palatine bone and they form the back or posterior part of the hard palate. So four bones make up the hard palate. They are separated by the sutures. The median palatine suture, median being the middle, and palatine, um, it's on the palate, so it, it separates, it goes all the way back. And then the transverse palatine suture is this one that comes right between the purple and the yellow bones, and it runs transversely or horizontally, because transverse and horizontal can be used interchangeably. Anybody have questions on that? So the palatine bones um, articulate with, they are the link between the maxilla and the sphenoid bone. So if you look back further at your skull here, hopefully it's close enough, you can see where the red sphenoid bone meets the purple palatine bones. And then behind it is the maxilla. So they are the link between the maxilla and the sphenoid bone, which was, they articulate and they articulate with each other. So in other words, they articulate or attach to each other because they're connected by a suture to each other. And the two horizontal plates articulate with each other at the posterior part of the median palatine suture underlying the median palatine raphe. So we talked about the median palatine suture goes all the way down between the yellow and the purple. And then um, the tissue part that covers that, that you can feel with your tongue and you're gonna look at when you look in um, each other's mouths is the median palatine raphe. And there's a picture of what the inside of your mouth looks like. And you kind of remember these probably from your chapter two surface anatomy. <clears throat> your palatine bones, um, these are just the skull pictures of the palatine bones. So you can kind of see the what picture on the left is the numbered, um, the little card that was in with the skulls. And that shows you that the palatine or horizontal plates of the palatine bones are number 14 and the palatine process of the maxilla is number six. Of the maxilla, meaning on the maxilla, and so they're in, ye in yellow because that's the color of the maxilla. So what foramina or foramina are on the palatine bones that we need to know? There are two that we need to know the greater palatine foramen and the lesser palatine foramen. And I think we looked at these, some of you got to see these on the skulls. I don't think all of you did because I only had two groups that day, but the larger one is the greater palatine foramen and it, it's located in the posterior lateral. So posterior lateral, if you break that word down, means posterior and lateral. So posterior, being more toward the back and lateral away from the midline. So you're going to kind of go posterior in a way <clears throat> of each palatine bone, usually at the apex of the maxillary third molar. So in other words, here's your maxillary third molar. It's your very back tooth. So if you go in, this is easier to see on the non-colored skull because I think they filled it in when they painted the colored skulls. out the non-colored skulls. So if you follow it in from the maxillary third molar and go posterior and lateral here, right about there, you can see a, a foramen. Can everybody see that? Can everybody see that frame? I'm trying to see if I get it. No. Okay. Anybody not be able to see that little hole or need a better view of it? And then 
Um, the larger greater palate is located. Oh, okay, we did that. The greater palatine foramen is approximately 10 millimeters medial and directly superior to the palatal gingival margin. So when you are looking to do a greater palatine injection, because you want to numb the tissue on the lingual or palatal side of the molars, the greater palatine foramen is 10 millimeters medial or toward the midline and directly superior or directly above the palatal gingival margin. So if the skull is, the person's laying in the chair like this and they've got their head back, you're going to take your finger and you're going to go um, medial or 10 millimeters toward the midline along their gingiva and ju just inside of that third molar and you're going to palpate with your finger. You can do this, I'm not supposed to encourage you to put your fingers in your mouth, so but if you wash your hands really well, you can feel it on yourself. And you can poke in that little hole. Now don't poke hard because it does kind of hurt if you poke on it, but you can poke on that little foramen and you can feel an indentation. The depression from the foramen can be palpated on the patient approximately midway between the median palatine raphae overlying the median palatine suture and the palatal gingiva so basically that's the same area, just a different description. I think somebody must have gotten kicked out of the meeting. Okay. Sorry about that. Somebody is trying to get back in the meeting. Um, so again, when you're giving this injection, now since the patient's head is going to be leaning back, we're going to be locating the foramen, but we're going to our needle placement is going to be just a little bit um, more anterior, so that when the anesthetic flows, because the head's tipped back, it will flow right to that foramen, because the nerve comes through that foramen. The greater palatine foramen transmits the greater palatine nerve and blood vessels, serving as a landmark for the administration of the greater palatine block. So when you're trying to numb that, that's the, you're going to be your um, landmark. A smaller opening nearby, the lesser palatine foramen transmits the lesser palatine nerve and blood vessels to the soft palate and tonsils. So you have to go pretty far back. You can see it on these. I don't know if you can see where my finger is po pointing, but there's a little indentation there. The bigger hole is the greater. And then there's a little smaller hole right about where, just in front of where my nail is. And that's the lesser palatine foramen. That supplies the nerves and the blood vessels to the soft palate and the tonsils. We are usually not doing anything to a person's soft palate or tonsils, so we would never really be numbing that area. Two bones fused together at the center at the single intermaxillary suture. So if you rotate your skull back forward. Let's see. Uh, you can't really see it very well on either of these skulls, but right down the center here is another suture. So your maxilla is actually two pieces or two bones that are fused together. Intermaxillary is inside the maxillary area intermaxillary suture and the maxilla articulates with all of those different bones so basically the maxilla articulates with almost everything or is attached to almost everything each maxilla so we're going to say the maxilla is two different bones that are fused each maxilla includes a body and four processes so we've got the, let's get the colored one back out again. It's easier to see. So we've got the frontal process of the maxilla. So remember the of the maxilla, if you change it to say, uh, instead of saying of, to say on, these are all going to be on the maxilla. So the process is an area that kind of jets out from to articulate where form another area. So the frontal process is going to be where the maxilla comes up and meets the frontal bone. The zygomatic process is going to be 
where the maxilla comes out and meets the zygomatic bone. The palatine process is going to be where the maxilla meets the palatine bones. So this is the part of the, of the maxilla that meets the palatine bones. And the alveolar process, here's one we haven't talked about yet, is the alveolar process. Alveolar refers to the bone that surrounds the teeth. So your alveolar bone is the bone that houses the roots of your teeth. So the alveolar process is where the maxilla meets the alveolar bone that contains the roots of the teeth. Just a side note, your maxillary sinuses are paired paranasal sinuses located within each body of the maxilla just posterior to the maxillary canines and premolars. So right behind your canines and premolars is an airspace, your maxillary sinus. So when you have sinus pressure, sinus problems, oftentimes um, they will, it'll manifest itself in putting pressure on the roots of your teeth. And so um, you can get some discomfort in your teeth. Sinus pressure or sinus problems and differentiating that from an actual tooth problem can be a little tricky when you're first starting out. I generally went with the idea of where are they having the tooth problems and what kind of symptoms are they having? And you can usually kind of rule out then whether or not you think it's just sinus or whether you think it's tooth related. If they're having sinus problems, usually it'll be more generalized. They'll say it hurts like right up here or it hurts when I press and they're pressing in several areas. It's not likely that all of their maxillary teeth on one side have abscessed at the same time. So unless they've had an accident or, some, or a fall or something. So it's likely that pressure is when they press on their sinuses. The sinus size varies according to individuals and their age. So some people have big sinuses, some people have little sinuses. However, these pyramid shaped sinuses are usually the largest of the paranasal sinuses and each one has an apex, three walls, a roof and a floor. So when you're talking in detail about sinuses, we talk about the different areas. Now, the one we really care about is the floor of the sinus. Because if you look at where your sinus is located on the skull, it would be right in here. And so right here is your alveolar process. So your roots of your teeth and the floor of your sinus a lot of times can meet. And that's why some people have more discomfort when they have sinus problems than others or when they have a cold and their teeth hurt because their sinuses are full. Where were they meet on the skull again? Can you point that out please? So your sinuses are going to be located like right about here and they'll drape down to about here. Okay and your can you see that? Can you lift it up just a little bit? Thank okay. you. And your teeth roots are coming up here. And so your sinus, the floor or the bottom of your sinus is sitting on the top of your roots of your teeth. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And so when they get filled with fluid, they can put pressure on those roots. Um, the floor of the sinus is also really important in dentistry. Um, those of you who've worked in dental offices may know or be aware that like when a patient loses a tooth and they are considering implants to replace the teeth. The floor of the sinus plays a huge role in that. When you lose these teeth, and even just one of them, the sinus floor will drop over time into that space. And I know Professor Bowles probably has some pretty good radiographs or images to show you when that happens, what it looks like. And you will be able to identify the floor of the sinus when you start taking radiographs, if you haven't already, I, I don't know, maybe you have, but um, so you'll start to look for that floor. That's also helps you if you're not sure whether it's an upper picture or lower when you take an image, look for the floor of the sinus and then rotate it accordingly. That's a big helper though when you are trying to 
figure out if they come in the if you take them in the wrong order or something. The apex of the pyramid of the maxillary sinus points into the zygomatic arch with the medial wall formed by the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. So that's a lot of words, but basically all they're saying is that this sinus goes back and it points into the zygomatic arch. So it would go kind of back this way in sort of a pyramid or a cone shape. And that the medial wall, so the wall closest to the inside of the maxillary sinus is formed by the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. So right here, basically. So the medial wall of the sinus meets the outer wall or lateral wall of the nasal cavity. And again, if you ever had a sinus infection and you press along the side of your nose and right on up on your cheek or below your eye, you can usually feel some discomfort there because that's all part of your sinus. The anterior wall or the front of your sinus um, corresponds with the anterior or facial wall of the maxilla. So right here. And the posterior wall is the infratemporal surface of the maxilla that corresponds to the maxillary tuberosity. So we know our maxillary tuberosity is all the way back here. So here's your maxillary. Oh, he's got an impacted wisdom tooth. See that impacted wisdom tooth up there? I'll use this side because it's not impacted on this side. So basically they're saying that the posterior wall is way back in here. Like right back here. And the roof is the orbital floor and the floor is is the alveolar process. So the we talked about how the floor is comes over the roots of the teeth or the alveolar process. The roof the roof of it um, is actually the floor of the orbit. Does everybody see that? So the top part of the sinus is the bottom part of the eye. And again, that's why a lot of times you'll even get pressure in your eyes when your sinuses are flared up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Let me just pop over here and make sure everybody's still in. Yep, okay. I actually do have to hold the skull kind of high for you guys to see, right? Okay, so this is just the clinical note. Due to the proximity of the maxillary sinus to the alveolar process, you can sometimes get discomfort in your teeth. Um, you have to differentiate when a patient comes in and you're the first person that sees the patient. Hi, how are you today? What's new? Any changes? They're going to tell you, I have some, I think I have something going on with my teeth up here because I have some discomfort. And so a lot of people have sinus problems due to weather. One of the first things that you're going to do is look outside and see what the weather looks like. If it's storming, that might be it. So let's see, what time is it? It is 8.50. Let's take a 10 minute break and come back at nine o'clock and continue this. Sound good? Yes. Sounds good, thank you. You're welcome. 
I have a question really quick. Sure. Um, for our quiz over all of this, the terms that you like really want us to focus on, is it the chapter three terms that you posted? For the, the quiz next Tuesday? Yes. Yes, yes, okay. it's just gonna be on chapter three. Okay, so we don't necessarily need to know like all the terms that are in the chapter, just kind of the ones that you put on there. Yes, okay. that would be true. Okay. And then I have a question on our homework assignment, just because we're kind of going over this. Do you want me to ask now or do you want me to wait? Until no, the no, that's fine. This will be a good time to ask. Okay, it is the. Oh, hang on. The second picture, the lateral view of the skull. Okay. Or no. Sorry, it's the third one. I'm sorry. Um, for number nine and ten. Is number nine, is that the greater? Or is it the lesser? All right, let me look at, let me open it up first. Okay. So I just want to make sure that I'm looking at the right thing since we're kind of going over that. Yes, I understand that. Okay. Okay, so the lateral view, and you're asking about uh, number, which one, nine? No, uh, the inferior view of the skull, um, number nine and 10. Oh, okay. I just wanna make sure since that shows us kind of where, like the areas that you were showing us, just don't wanna study it incorrectly. OK, so yes, so number nine. Um, do you remember which foramen was located right behind your front teeth? And then number 10 would be the one we just talked about today. That's right inside the third molar. And that's actually a really good picture of how it's right inside, pretty much just inside the third molar. So would number 10 be the lesser? No, well, you actually 10 and 11 are the ones you are looking at. OK, not 9 and 10. OK, so do you remember which ones behind the front teeth? The incisive. Yeah, OK, mm -hmm. and then you've got you've got your incisive foramen, which is right behind your front teeth, mm -hmm. which is where the incisive our nasopalatine nerve is going to come through and it's going to innervate the lingual pa um, anterior palate. And then you've got your um, greater palatine, which should be right where number 10 is. OK. And then right behind it where number 11 is, is the lesser. OK, that makes sense now. So the greater palatine foramen is bigger and it's closer to the front or in the case of this inferior view, the easier way to remember it is it's greater, it's above, it's superior. The lesser is lower and behind. OK. So we have three on the palette that we pay attention to. OK, I got you now. It's just they were so close together and I wanted to make sure I wasn't studying it incorrectly. Yes, they are very close together on the skull, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Okay. Am I still sharing the screen then? Mm, I don't know yeah. why this keeps yeah. popping up. I keep getting a pop up for Microsoft Teams and I can't seem to get rid of it. I put in the verification code and then it doesn't do anything. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. So did you say nine was the incisive foramen? If it's right behind the two front, I closed the screen already. If it's right behind the two front teeth, yes. Okay. All right, so back to the PowerPoint here.
Does anybody else have any questions about the stuff we talked about? Did you guys get a chance to look at the Ken Hub? First of all, is anybody not logged into Ken Hub? Or had problems getting logged in? OK, so since you're all able to log into Ken Hub, have you all had a chance or anybody not have a chance to look at any of the movies or the um, demons, the, you know, where they show the pictures of them and stuff? Anybody not be able to see the videos? I haven't quite yet, no. OK, so make sure that you get a chance to do that. And um, if you have to to help you study or look at just keep Googling and pulling up different pictures, different views and see if you can locate the same things. I gave you a study guide. And on that written study guide, um, next to each of the parts, like it'll name the foramen and it'll tell you what it's for. You will need to know those things. You will need to know what they what happens there, what comes out of that, why it's important. Some of them don't have anything because there really isn't anything I that you absolutely either couldn't know already or need to know for the purposes of the class. But the ones that have stuff next to it, you will be responsible for knowing the, that material. Just like how I just said the incisive foramen is where the nasopalatine nerve comes through and blood supply to the anterior part of the hard palate. So from canine to canine, those those are the kinds of things you will need to know. So as you're going through, it would probably be a good idea to one print that study guide if you can. If you can't, you don't have access to a printer or anything like that, then if you have a laptop or a desktop, open your pictures on that and have that handout open on your phone so that you can look at them at the same time. If you don't have access to doing that, just open both of them up on your whatever device you're using and flip back and forth. So open that handout, find the word and locate it on a picture. There are lots and lots of um, pictures that you can Google that are blank, just like what I have for my practice thing or your homework assignment, I guess I should say. They're blank and then they, they'll have the the one that's actually labeled like right next to it, or you can find the exact same one labeled. And so you might want to play around with something like that and see if you can label it and then go back and look at the answers and make sure you're looking at the right things. But do know what what those landmarks are for or why I care about those things. Um, they're going to help you in the next few chapters when we're identifying other things. So you're going to have to kind of take a lot of initiative to look at different resources. Ken Hub is perfect though. It's got the videos. It's got the bones and color so you can see the actual bone that you're looking at. Um, so it would be really good to utilize that resource. And whatever other ones you have. I have a question. OK. On the study guide, I did have one question because we went over the sinuses for the maxil maxillary, mm -hmm. and on here it says the frontal sinuses. Are those the same thing? No, that's an excellent question. Thank you for bringing that up. So on your sinuses, let me get your skull back out here. OK. So those are your maxillary sinuses. Those are the ones that usually you hear about when you get a sinus infection. Your frontal sinus is right up here. I don't know if you guys can all see that. It's right up here in this area. So if you were to take your forehead and press right here, I don't know if you've ever gotten a headache where it hurts like right up here between your eyes kind of area. Is it kind of by the frontal eminence? Yes, exactly. So it's right there in the frontal bone area and where the frontal eminence is and it, sometimes it'll get fluid in it too and you'll press on that or you'll get pressure on your eyes because if obviously if you look inside the skull there are lots of um, where that sinus would be up in here there are structures that innervate your eyes 
And so that would be why sometimes you get sinus pressure or pressure up in that area. That's your frontal sinus. And then down here are your maxillary sinuses. Okay. And at the very at the very end, we're going to talk about the sinuses here. So we'll go over that again. But those are two different things. Good question. Anybody else have questions? So please feel free to ask them as we go because you guys, it's helpful. Um, if you have the question, it's likely somebody else in your group has the question as well and just doesn't want to ask. So you learn from each other by asking questions. Oh, oh somebody going to say something? Okay. Let me just start this again. Okay, so due to the proximity that we already went over the maxillary sinus and then um, you can see bone number six is the maxilla. So it's a big bone. It goes um, in pretty deep. It covers a lot of surface area. Okay, from the anterior view. So we're going to look at this skull from the anterior or front view, like if it's staring right at us. Inferior, okay, so inferior means? Below. Below, good. Hold on just a second. I just want to make sure we're still recording. Okay, I am just making sure. I don't want to miss this part. Okay, so inferior or below the infraorbital foramen. If you look at this skull right here, there's a little opening or a little foramen. Can everybody see that? That's the infraorbital foramen. Infra below the orbit. And um, below that or inferior to that foramen, so if we follow it down or inferior, um, is an elongated depression, the canine fossa, which is just posterior to this and su superior to each of the roots of the maxillary canines. So if you look for your canine tooth and you look for that infraorbital foramen, there's a depression just posterior and superior to the root. So right up in here, can you guys see where my finger is? Right up in here. There's a depression and you can feel it on your own teeth. Um, I don't want you to stick your fingers in your mouth unless you've washed your hands thoroughly, but you can feel that depression. The canine has a big, thick root and it sticks out pretty far. That you can feel without even going in your mouth, but just touching, you can feel that. Um, right, just posterior to it, it dips in and that's called the canine fossa. The reason we care about the canine fossa um, and the canine eminence, so an eminence is an outer, that's that big round root. So the more prominent facial ridge over each of the roots of the maxillary canines is the canine eminence. So you're going to go over the bump or the canine eminence and you're going to land in the canine fossa. And those two landmarks are important because when you're giving your ASA or anterior superior alveolar injection to numb the front teeth, upper front teeth, you're going, those are your landmarks. You're going to go um, just at, above the canine eminence, so just above. And by the time you angle your, in, your syringe to go in, you're going to be in the canine fossa, and that's where that nerve is that you're going to want to hit to numb. So two important landmarks for you there. From the lateral view, each zygomatic process of the maxilla articulates with the zyg zygomatico maxillary suture, with the maxillary process of the zygomatic bone laterally completing the medial part of the infraorbital rim. So that's kind of a lot of wording. Remember I told you on sutures, all of the lesser sutures, they will com just combine the two bones, the name of the two bones that meet. So in other words, they took the zygomatic and the maxillary and the suture that meets, they called it the zygo, zygomatico maxillary suture. That's not one of the sutures we need to memorize for this class. If you're just memorizing them, 
but it's an easy one to find. If I were to put that on a test, which I won't, but if I were, I can't promise you boards won't, you can just divide that word in half and you know you're looking for the zygomatic and the maxillary and where they meet. So let me show you on the colored skull. Here's the zygomatic bone, here's the maxilla, and that area where they, area right there where they meet, zygomatic maxilla, that's the zygomatical maxillary suture. And so that part of the zygomatic bone completes the medial part of the infraorbital rim. Processes. Remember that a process is a general term for any prominence on a bony surface. So when we say the maxillary process of, we're talking about a prominence of a, any prominence on a bony surface. So this zygomatic bone has prominent has um, processes or prominences. So let's see, and then there's just a couple of examples. And remember, of the means on the. So the maxillary process or the zygomatic process of the maxilla means it's on the maxilla and it goes toward the zygomatic bone. So that would be right here. Right here. The infratemporal surface of the maxillary, maxilla Excellent. Inferior to the temple is convex, directed to the posterior and to the lateral, and forms part of the infraorbital process. Don't worry about infratemporal fossa, sorry. Don't worry about this just yet. I'm going to show you where that is in a few minutes. You have some fossas in your skull, and fossas are just like indentations or depressions, and there are things that sit in those fossa like um, plexuses of veins and arteries, um, nerves and nerve endings and things like that all sit um, ganglion. They sit inside those fossas or depressions. And so there's a few major ones in the skull that we need to know, and we're gonna kind of cover those in a minute. But basically this infratemporal one um, is pretty important. It is the one, um, it's hard to show because it's, one you almost it's inside the skull but um it's if it's infra or deep inside the temporal surface which is this temporal bone right here so it's kind of inside here this area right here and that's important that infratemporal fossa is important to you because it houses some vein plexuses of veins and arteries so when you're giving your posterior superior alveolar injection and you're taking your, I don't know if you can see your needle back like this, you're kind of aiming in that area. And so it's really common to go in too deep and to get into that area. And when you aspirate, you draw blood. So um, we will teach you how to not do that when we're in class, in anesthesia class. But the picture up on the top, which shows the lateral view of the skull, is pretty good that it shows you it's kind of right in this area right here. And the fossa, of course, is a depression. You can sort of see it right in here. Is the depression. And that's where there are things lying. Okay. So from the lateral view, the, the maxilla on the posterior part of the body, so the backside of the body of the maxilla is a rounded, roughened elevation called the maxillary tuberosity. And it's just posterior to the most distal maxillary molar. So it's right back here. And um, Professor Bowles will show you that on a radiograph, but I put a radiograph in there for you to see. And it's just kind of a rough looking bony piece. And that's what it looks like on a radiograph. When you feel it with your tongue, it's smooth. Excuse me, it's smooth because it's covered with tissue and it's wet from your saliva, so it feels nice and smooth. But underneath, it's kind of a rougher looking bone. 
So if we flip it up and we're looking from the inferior view now, just palatal to the maxillary central incisors is the incisive foramen. I'm going to switch the skull here for a minute because it's easier to see on this one. But if you look at this skull right here, there's a little indentation just behind the maxillary um, incisor teeth, and that's your incisive foramen. And that's where your nasopalatine nerves pass through. When you're reading your book, there's also something called an incisive nerve. That's the incisive nerve does not go through the incisive foramen. Of course, that would be way too easy, right? So um, the nasopalatine, remember naso in, is your nose and palate, palatine would be your palate. So it's right between your nose and your palate on the inside. The tissue that covers it, right there okay we remember we talked about that does anybody remember what that one's called incisive papilla incisive papilla thank you okay mandible now we're going to look at the mandible the mandible has a lot of things to look at on it so this is what your mandible looks like without a tongue and cheeks and all that um, it's a single bone, so it's just one big solid bone, and it's your only freely movable bone in the skull. So if you think about it, it's the only one that can move by itself. When you chew, your mandible moves, not your skull. There are no bones in your skull that move freely because they're all connected by sutures, which is like a fibrous tissue that holds them together. So they are all stuck together. The mandible is the only free movable one. Even the condyles where they, where they um, attach on are separated by the discs. So they're not like um, fused together to bone. They don't articulate. It has a what we call a movable articulation. So it, there's a disc in between, but it's not actually fused to the temporal bone. And it's your strongest facial bone. So it's a very strong bone. So when you get punched and you break your mandible, if you break your mandible or you have a car accident, it's a pretty big, strong bone to break. The maxilla is more porous. It's not quite as strong. It's still a big, strong bone, but it's not as strong as the mandible. This becomes kind of important in dentistry when you're talking about placing implants or grafting bone, um, periodontal disease, um, any of those kinds of things. There's a difference between the maxilla and the mandible when it comes to those um, particular procedures or, or complications. From the anterior view or looking straight at the mandible, you have your mental protuberance, which is right down here. It's your chin, it's right down here. It's a bony prominence of the chin located inferior to the roots of the mandibular incisors. So here's your mandibular incisors, and it's located just below the incisors. And your mandibular symphysis is a faint ridge at the midline. midline. So during the developmental process, this ridge forms. And you can kind of feel that a little bit, you have to press sort of hard, but if you do, you can kind of feel that little bit of ridge. You have a mental foramen. So if you rotate your mandible and you find your premolar teeth, so right here are your premolar teeth, just below it is something called the mental foramen. And I don't know if in Professor Bowles' class you started looking for that yet on images, but if you look at the bottom picture there um, on slide 41, you can see that little dark circle right at the apex of your mandibular second premolar. That is your mental foramen. That is the opening for your um, mental incisive nerve. So that's um, what innervates part of your mandibular teeth. Does everybody see that okay? See if we can, is that close enough for you to see? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I have so, another thing to add to that. Um, I found an app. I don't know if it's available for Androids because I have an iPhone, but it's called Dental Panoramic Radiology. And um, it's for radiography, but it kind of ties into this. But when you get on the app, you can click on surrounding structures, maxilla, or mandible, and it will show you um, pictures, like x-rays, of all of these. And mental foramen is one of them. Angle of the mandible. There's like a whole bunch of different pictures of the structures of the mouth, and you can click on which ones you want to see so you know what they look like in an x-ray as well. Do you guys have the ability to to communicate as a group? Yes, we have a group chat. Okay, would you mind sending that information um, to your group chat so that everybody like has it written down and can do it? The reason I'm saying that is that's a really good, if you found something like that, that's an excellent resource for you to have. Um, as you get closer to taking boards, believe it or not, you tend to forget some of these things and in between now and term seven. And so um, Professor Bowles has put together some exercises like they're on like a laminated sheet where you have to identify all of these different features on radiographs on a pano or on bite wings or whatever you might happen she has on there. But it's kind of sounds like it's a lot like what you're talking about it, which would be an excellent way to to study. Some of this stuff you might want to review every now and then just so you don't forget it because when you're in clinic and you're looking at radiographs and you look at that radiograph, the first thing that comes to your mind is a, an abscess at the apex, especially right after you have perio class and we discuss abscesses, you're like tuned into abscesses and you're looking everywhere for abscesses and that's the first thing that pops in your mind is that that dark halo has to be an abscess, but it's not. And so it would be good every now and then to review some of those things so that when you're in clinic, you know what you're looking at um, and not just kind of count on the instructors to tell you what you're looking at. Um, part of that is good too, because um, we take up points for starters if you don't know these things by the time you should know these things. Um, but also it just helps you in your own ability to make a diagnosis, discuss intelligently with a patient, all that kind of stuff. So if you wouldn't mind sharing that with your group, that would be wonderful. And if you could send it to me too in an email, that would be even better. Okay, I sent it in the group and I will get ready to send it to you in an email right now. Perfect, thank you. You're but welcome. anyway, that, that's where the nerve passes through um, that innervates your premolar area. And um, when you're giving injections, there's one called the mental incisive injection. And so if you have a patient, let's say for example, you have a patient that doesn't have any molars, which we have a lot of patients like that. You will see a lot of those patients. They don't have any molars. And so there's no need to give them an, a, a complete block that numbs everything if you can just give this mental incisive and numb from the premolars to the anterior. And so the first thing you will do to give that injection is open up your images and see if you can find that mental foramen's not in the exact same place on everybody. Sometimes it might be a little bit closer to the first premolar. Sometimes it might be a little farther back to the molar area. But you, you're going to want to locate that because your needle placement has to be in a specific area in proximity to that foramen. And so as she was saying, here are the parts of the mandible. So we're going to start with, we've got the body of the mandible. The body of the mandible is called the base. So it's the heavy horizontal part of the lower jaw inferior to the mental foramen. So you see the mental foramen right here. So it's right below it, it's inferior. And you can feel that on your face, you can feel the edge of it. If you press underneath your, your, your jaw area, that's the body of the mandible or the base. It's pretty thick and solid. And superior or just above this is the part of the lower jaw that usually contains the roots of the mandibular teeth called the alveolar process of the mandible. 
So we had the alveolar bone that covered the, the maxillary teeth roots. That's called the alveolar process of the maxilla because it came off the maxilla and wrapped around the teeth. And now you've got the alveolar process of the mandible. So this body of the mandible, the process extends off and it houses the roots of the mandibular teeth. So if you take your finger and you rub along your, right along your teeth, you can feel the roots, but they're set inside that bone called the alveolar process of the mandible. And then you've got the stout flat plates of the mandibular ramus. So this flat part right here is the ramus and you've got it on both sides. And then you've got the anterior border of the mandibular ramus or the front border is a thin sharp margin that terminates to the coronoid process. So if you slide down here, this sharp thing is the coronoid process. So if you feel the mandible, I know you can't because you don't have it in front of you, but it's a, actually a sharper edge right here, this part right here. That's the coronoid process, and this right here. The main part of the anterior border of the mandibular ramus forms a concave forward curve called the coronoid notch. So if you follow this down, there's a little indentation right here as you're curving downward, and you can barely see it. You're not going to be able to see it from here but you can barely see it when you're, even when you have it up close, but it dips in right there. That's called the coronoid notch. So it's a concave forward curve. If you were to see a question like this on a quiz or a test, it would probably say concave forward curve, and that would be the coronoid notch. Why do we care about that little notch? Because that's gonna be your landmark when you're doing your inferior alveolar nerve block. So when you're trying to numb the whole side of the mandible and the inside of the tongue, you're going to be aiming for that notch. Can you feel it on yourself or on everybody? Sometimes it's really hard. So when you are giving injections, the first thing we're gonna want you to do is feel for the notch. Sometimes you can't find the notch. And so we have to kind of improvise. And when we get to local anesthesia, we'll show you how to do that but sometimes it's kind of hard to find the notch. And you feel something, but you're not feeling the notch. So um, we'll work with that when we get into that part, but just remember that that is also the landmark for the inferior alveolar block. Because it's likely, if you were to see this question on a quiz, hint, hint, it would talk about the concave forward curve, and it would also mention the landmark for the inferior, in, inferior alveolar block, or IA as we call it in dentistry. And just inferior to that notch, um, the anterior border of the ramus becomes the external oblique line. So um, the external oblique line is kind of right on the edge here of this, and that's called the external oblique line. And so they, if you look from the top, this is the external oblique line right here. It's kind of this edge right here. Okay, the posterior border of the ramus is thicker and extends from the angle of the mandible, which is the juncture between the ramus, the ramus, and the body. So this Angle is an angle. They're not very creative about that term. Angle of the mandible is where it angles. It's where the ramus and the body join, and it's right here. Forms kind of a rounded angle. And then, um, let's see, the body and the mandible. To a large, more posterior projection called the condyloid process, that would be this up here. I don't know if you can see that. So you have coronoid and you have condyloid. This process consists of two parts, the mandibular condyle and the constricted part that supports it, its neck. 
So this is the part, if you put the skull back together for a second, see if I can hold it with one hand. If you put this, the skull back together, it sits like, it sits like this, like this. And so here's where the um, TMJ is. It's where that the, the temporal bone meets the mandible and it rotates right here on that process. So the, that's called the mandibular condyle. So the condyloid process is this. The mandibular condyle is this part that where it rotates. So right here. And then you have the the neck, which is the part. Think of like your head and your neck. You've got the head on top. You've got the neck. It is the landmark for the administration of the Gau Gates mandibular block. So when you put these back together like this, and you can see how far back this joint is. So the Gau, Gau Gates block um, blocks the entire side of the mandible with one injection. We do not teach the Gau Gates block here in um, at Concord, we don't. We didn't learn it at UMKC. I have never done a Gal Gates block in my life. So we always do the IA or inferior alveolar, and a long buckle and a lingual. So it's three injections. The reason I think we don't do the Gal Gates mandibular block is um, just because it's a little bit harder, I think, to do um, from what people have said. But there are a few. Um, I think Professor Seastrand might be the only one of us that does a, that knows how to do the Gal Gates. Maybe Professor Bowles, I'm not sure. But um, we don't do them in clinic. And so maybe sometime um, or oftentimes when you get into term seven and we have like extra time, Dr. Thurlow will show you or teach you individually how to do it, but we don't do it in class. The articulating surface of the condyle is the oval head of the condyle involved in the TMJ. So that would be the articulating surface. Articulating is where it articulates with the temporal bone or moves with the temporal bone. Anybody have any questions so far? No. And this is just another picture. Um, this one's in your book. It shows you where somebody got kicked out, it sounds like. Sorry. So this just marks those different areas we just talked about. So when you're looking at the condyloid process, the condyloid process is this area right here. So it consists of the articulating surface of the condyle, the neck of the man mandibular condyle, so it's this part here, the neck that holds the head and the neck. And then the mandibular condyle right here. So this is the art. Um, this is called the condyloid process right here. A this in between part right here where it dips down is called the mandibular notch. And that's just where it dips down right here. And this is what the mandible looks like when it's inside your head. So between the coronoid process and the condyle is a depression called the mandibular notch or sigmoid notch. You may see it called sigmoid notch in some textbooks or Ken Hub, I think, mentions it, but they're the same thing. It's the mandibular notch. And so this is what the mandible looks like when it's inside your face. And you can see that little purple um, ball up there is the TMJ. So I noticed you guys, when I walked past the classroom the other day, you were doing extra oral exams on each other. Did Professor Ramos show you how to check the TMJ? Yes? Yeah. Okay, so that's exactly right there is what, this is what you're, you're actually feeling. That's where the, the articulating surface is rotating with the temporal bone 
and you're putting your fingers right here next to it and feeling it move. And then if you look at the mandible as it's facing in that picture and you slide down, the coronoid notch is right about here, that little notch. And so when the patient opens their mouth and you're going to give your injection, you're coming, you're aiming for that notch. On the um, surface, the tissue surface are those as the um, pterygomandibular fold is right there on the outer surface or the inner surface. I mean, the tissue surface, it covers that area. So when you're going in and you're visualizing, you're feeling for the notch and you're looking for the fold and you go right in that area and that should guide you right back to where you want to be. Then we've got the medial view. So we're going to look at the closer to the center, closer to the midline, the medial view of the body of the mandible. So we've got the body of the mandible, which is this right here, this bottom part. Now we've got the ramus. So this whole thing right here is the ramus. We've got right inside here, you can't even see it on our skull anymore, but there are some little bumps right down here, like below the roots of the teeth, called genial tubercles. They are small projections and muscles attached to that. So when next chapter, chapter four, when we learn about the muscles, there are some muscles that attach, tongue muscles that attach to that. You will see it on an image or radiograph. It'll be like kind of a white circle because it's it's radiopaque. It's more dense. So you've got your retromolar triangle. Your retromolar triangle is right behind your last molar tooth. And it's this little triangular area right up here. When you look inside of your mouth or a patient's mouth, that's the retromolar pad, covers the retromolar triangle. And then you've got something called your mylohyoid, excuse me, mylohyoid line or internal oblique ridge. They are the same thing. Those terms are used interchangeably. So you may see it as mylohyoid line, or you may see it as internal oblique ridge. The external oblique ridge we said was right here. And if you go on the inside, your internal oblique ridge is right down here. And it's kind of hard to see on this, but you can see it in that picture fa fairly well. And if I show you pictures for your midterm, or well, when I show you pictures for your midterm and your final, your practicals, it will be very noticeable like it is in this picture that you're looking at. Then you've got your submandibular and submental fossas. Submandibular fossa is down right about here. So kind of just below the molar area. And it houses your submandibular gland. And then you've got your submental, or I'm sorry, sub, yeah, submental or sublingual fossa, which is right down in the front and it houses your submental gland or sublingual gland. So submandibular is back behind submental, sublingual is right up closer to the front. Okay, so your sublingual fossa contains your sublingual salivary gland located superior to the anterior part of the mylohyoid line and your submandibular fossa. And this is just a nice closer picture. You can actually see in this picture how the fossa looks, especially on the sublingual, where it's that really thick um, or dipped in area. That's exactly what a fossa should look like. And then you've got your mylohyoid line which runs all the way here and right below it in the molar area is your submandibular fossa. From the medial view, so if you're looking, sitting on your tongue, looking out, the medial view like this, 
you have your mandibular foramen, which is on the medial surface of the ramus. So here's the ramus. And uh, let's see, you can find the foramen. It's kind of hard to see in here. It's right inside here. So when you're looking at the mandible, you can kind of see this thickness here. It's this little opened area right here. That's the mandibular foramen. And overhanging it is this bony spine called the lingula. So this is hard to see for you to see, but if you look at some of your Ken Hub pictures, look at some like three-dimensional pictures, you can kind of see where it sticks out. The lingula kind of hangs over like an umbrella. So think of it that way. The lingula hangs over the mandibular foramen. Now don't get your mandibular foramen confused with the mandibular notch. The mandibular notch is up here. It's just a notch. A foramen is a hole, so your mandibular foramen is down here. And your lingula kind of goes over it. Think of it sort of like an umbrella or a protector. And then coming out of them, there's a thicker kind of area, a wider like indentation called the mylohyoid groove. So it's going to go out from the foramen and kind of extend anteriorly. It doesn't go very far, but it kind of goes anteriorly. Your pterygoid fovea is a triangular depression, or fovea as some people say, is a triangular depression located inferior to the articular surface of the condyle on the anterior surface of the neck. So your pterygoid fovea is this part like right here. So you're on the condyle and it's right here on the anterior surface. It serves as the attachment for the lateral pterygoid muscle. So when we get into the um, muscles next chapter, remember that little spot right here. The mandible has a lot of or has several muscle attachments because it's got your muscles of mastication and then it all which are four of them and it also has the muscles of the tongue that attach, and then it's got your um, hyoid or your, as you come down into your neck area, it's got hyoid muscles that attach too. So you've got a lot of attachments on your mandible. Three large deeper depressions or fossa are present on the external surface of the skull. So now we're back to the skull. These fossa are prominent landmarks of the skull that can be used for locating associated muscles as well as nerves and blood vessels that travel within them. And they are the temporal fossa, the infratemporal, and the pterygopalatine. They're kind of difficult without holding a skull in your hands to demonstrate because they're basically depressions in other bones. Um, so they form like, it'd be like if you were holding a cup and each of those sides of the cup were different bones. The fossa is the depression or the inner, inner part of the cup. So the temporal fossa is a flat fan-shaped paired depression on the lateral surface of the skull. So this is your temporal bone and your temporal fossa is just lies within the temporal bone. So it's this right here. And if you were feeling a skull right now, you'd be able to tell right here, it, dip, it dips in on this bone. And you can kind of feel it on your head too. When you feel your head, it dips in in the temporal area. Temporal fossa contains the body of the temporalis muscle and area of blood vessels and nerves. Your temporalis muscle, we'll learn next um, chapter, is one of your muscles of mastication. So it helps you to be able to chew your food or move your mouth. And this next slide, 55, shows you kind of that big area. It puts the temporalis muscle in the place on the picture on the right, and the muscle fills that whole space. Infratemporal fossa, there's one on each side. Just like the temporal fossa, there was one on each side. The infratemporal fossa is a paired depression located inferior to the anterior part of the temporal fossa. So here's the temporal fossa right here. 
and it's going to be inferior and anterior. So it's going to be right in here. I don't know how well you can see that, but it's basically going to be right. Let me see if I can turn this up right in here. So the infratemporal process um, it goes to where the sphenoid bone is. So let's see, it's right about the sphenoid bones, that red bone. So you can kind of see where my finger lies in that dip right there. Right there, that's the infratemporal fossa. And again, so that holds um, veins and arteries that supply blood and nerve tissue to your teeth. And so that little depression right there, when you're giving an injection, a PSA, your needle is coming in like this and you're kind of well, it's like this and you're kind of aiming for that area. You don't want to go too deep and get in that area because it's very veiny and you will definitely get a positive aspiration and you can cause something called, called a hematoma. So if you nick a blood vessel and it bleeds into the area, you know how like on your surface of your skin you'll get a bruise, you'll, it'll kind of get puffy and swollen. Both the temporal fossa and the infratemporal fossa are divided by the infratemporal crest. I'm going to show you where that crest is. It's right, it's right here. But you don't need to know that for a for the test. You won't. I won't point to that. But just know that the crest divides the two fossas. A crest is kind of like a um, spiky fan shape kind of thing. All right. It is 9:52. Let's take a break until about three minutes after 10. I know it's an odd time. Um, and then we'll resume here because I want to make sure we get through this and do a little quick review for your quiz on Thursday. And hopefully you'll have all the information you need. So go ahead and take a short break. Come back in a few minutes.
<laughs> All right, does anybody have any questions so far? Anybody? I have a question. OK. The submandibular fossa and submental fossa are not on the review that you put online. Did you want us to know those as well for the quiz? Yes. OK. OK, so this is um, slide 57 is just another view of the infratemporal fossa. It would be as if you took the skull like this and you rotated it slightly this way so you could see inside. You can kind of get an idea of this area right. Let's see right here. Are where your fossas are your tergopalatine palatine fossa. If you think of palatine being the the palatine bone, the tergopalatine palatine fossa is like distal to the palatine bone. So it's like pretty deep in there. Um, it has some landmarks we're going to talk about later on too, but these three fossas um, just basically know, I think they're, if you look, they're on the study guide and it tells you what they're for. The infratemporal one is probably the biggest one we need to know about because it houses part of the pterygoid plexus of veins. The pterygoid plexus of veins is a large group of veins that come together and they form almost like um, if you thought of spaghetti and in a glob um, and they're up in that part of it's up in that fossa and like I said when we're doing the PSA injection we're aiming in that area but we don't want to go in too deep because we don't want to get into that plexus of veins because you will get a lot of bleeding if you do, and a hematoma if you accidentally get into those veins. A hematoma is a um, is where it like bleeds out and it becomes very um, puffy and big, and the face will be swollen. It's uncomfortable, um, but we will be teaching you how to not do that. So, um, and we always aspirate so that if we were to be injecting into a vein, and we aspirate, we'll get blood, and we know not to inject in there. We have to take the needle out and start over. So we'll go through all that when we get into anesthesia. But for now, you do want to know that that pterygoid plexus, part of it's in the infratemporal fossa. The pterygopalatine fossa is a cone-shaped paired depression deep, deep meaning more toward the middle, um, to the infratemporal fossa and posterior to the maxilla on each side of the skull. So that's just what I was kind of showing you, um, it's behind, kind of behind the palate inside. This smaller but still important fossa is located between the pterygoid process and the maxillary tuberosity. So if you were looking at your skull, let's go this way, your pterygoid process is right here, your lateral and medial pterygoid plates with your fossa in the middle. So your, um, that's your pterygoid process and the maxillary tuberosity is right here. So it would lie somewhere right in like this area right here. Close to the apex of the orbit. So it's like, it's so hard to describe, right back in like here, this area. The fossa communicates via fissures and foramina in its walls with the, with the cranial cavity, the infratemporal fossa, the orbit, and the nasal cavity. You don't need to know all of that. Don't just know, just be aware that it is deep to the infra, infratemporal fossa. So you've got your temporal, infratemporal, and then you've got your pterygo, pterygopalatine fossa. So it's got the three fossas, and they move inward in the skull. So there's the, that same picture again pointed out. On slide 60, um, the cervical vertebrae. So we're going to talk just a little bit about them. We only learned a couple, couple of them, but the cervical vertebrae are located um, in the vertebral column between the skull and the thoracic vertebra. 
All seven cervical vertebrae have a central vertebral foramen for the spinal cord. So the vertebrae are kind of shaped like this, and they have an opening or a foramen or a hole that runs down through all of them. So it's like they were stacked rings with a hole down the center, and that's where the spinal cord comes through. We're only going to learn the first two of the cervical vertebrae. The first one is called the atlas. It articulates with the skull at the occipital condyles. The occipital condyles are right here next to the foramen magnum. And here's the occipital condyles. And so the first cervical vertebrae or atlas articulates with the condyles. The second vertebrae is the axis. So atlas, axis, AT comes before AX. Atlas is first, axis is second. It's characterized by the dens or odontoid process. I don't have a model of that. I can't show you that. You can see it on the picture. It would be a worded question. It, it would be about the dens or odontoid process. The dens articulates anteriorly with the anterior arch of the first cervical vertebrae. So the dens is what articulates with the first vertebrae or the atlas. So you've got your atlas, which articulates with your occipital condyles right here, these flat things right here. And then you've got your axis, which through the dens articulates with the axis. I mean the atlas. Atlas, axis, first, second. AT comes before AX. And if you were doing your extra oral exam, I think when you were feeling around the other day on each other, you may have felt back there underneath the occipital bone. You can feel the mastoid processes with your fingers. The mastoid processes, again, were these two areas right here. You've got your mastoid process, your styloid process, or this little spiny thing, and your stylomastoid foramen in between. Your stylomastoid foramen is important because it's where your facial nerve passes through the skull. That is on your handout. Um, your hyoid bone is suspended in the neck from the styloid process. So here's your styloid process, the little spiny, spiky thing, sharp. So your hyoid bone is suspended in the neck from that. It's kind of a horseshoe shape like this. So it kind of looks like that. It does not articulate with any other bones, giving its characteristic mobility, which is necessary for mastication, swallowing, and speech. So it helps to move all those muscles and tissue. And then you've got the body, and you can see I don't have a hyoid bone to show you either, but if you look at that picture on slide 64, you can see the thick body part or the bottom of the horseshoe down here is the body of the hyoid bone. And then you've got your two projections that stick out like horns, like this, and those are the greater coronu and the lesser. And if you look, you can see you've got two big tall ones and then you've got shorter ones next to it. Greater are the big ones, lesser, smaller. And that's it for this one. So I know that's a lot of information. What I would recommend you do is, um, if you can, print that study guide. If you can't print it, have it open whenever you're looking at something. You should be able to go through that study guide and you should be able to find everything on that study guide. If you get to that study guide and you find a word that you can't find, then go back to some of your pictures. You've got all kinds of resources to use. You can use your Ken Hub, which is what I would recommend first. You can use your textbook as well. Your textbook has those um, cards in the back of it. If you haven't already discovered those cards, they are in the back of the textbook. So go ahead and um, 
find them in the textbook and look at the cards in the textbook. You can also Google some things to look them up. Um, I would also look at YouTube videos. The ones I showed you were really good resources, but there are all kinds of other ones. So if you still watch, if you watch those and you still don't know for sure, just do um, a YouTube search for that particular bone or that particular foramen, and it will pull up all kinds of videos for that. Does that make sense? If you're still having problems finding or understanding something, by all means, email me and I will be glad to explain it to you or send you to a resource that will explain it so that you can understand it. You will need to know the those terms on the um, sheet and you will need to know what each of those things is associated with. So again, if it's the foramen ovale, it's where the third division three of the trigeminal nerve passes through the skull. That kind of thing. Is that making sense to everybody? I have one more question. Okay. Can you show us the hypo 